Welcome all. Uh, my name is James Pustyowski. I'm the chair of the AERA SIG on systematic review and meta analysis. Uh, and on behalf of the SIG, uh, uh, as well as our sponsors, um, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the, uh, the first, first seminar of the fall season here. Um, uh, our speaker today is Dr. Mariola Moyert, uh, who is an associate professor of um, uh, educational statistics at SUNY Albany. Um, Mariola has been working now for uh, quite a while on uh, in the area of um, uh, meta-analysis of single case research designs, uh, as well as meta-analysis of uh, other forms of dependent data. Uh, and she's been extremely productive in this area. Um, and uh, is uh, one thing I, I, I quite appreciate about her work is it is both like pushing forward uh, in terms of the technical sophistication. It's also very, very clear uh, and accessible to, to wide audiences. Um, so, and she, uh, today she will be speaking on um, um, individual participant data, meta-analysis of, of single case designs. Um, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, we, we will be, or we are recording um, uh, the presentation. So I, I guess you're, uh, if you um, don't want your, your, uh, face to appear on that video at any point, you may wanna turn your turn your video off um, and uh, uh, just be aware that we're recording. Um, we, will, uh, uh, we will be monitoring the chat um, during the presentation. Uh, so if you have questions that, uh, you know, burning questions that, that you feel like it would be worth um, um, pausing to answer, just put them in the chat and we'll, we will um, uh, flag Mariola, try to get her attention. For those, uh, and the, the, the chat can also be the, the starting point for uh, our discussion period um, after the presentation. So uh, I think, uh, Mariola, you're gonna go about 45 minutes or so, and yeah. then we should have time for questions at the, uh, after that. Um, one other note, um, so the, this seminar is sponsored by the AERA SIG on systematic reviews, and the SIG is currently seeking nominations for uh, officers, uh, including uh, the chair, the program chair, treasurer, secretary, and then there's also an opportunity for graduate students to get involved in the SIG. Um, we would very much uh, uh, love to get new people involved in the leadership of the SIG. So if, you, if you're even a tiny bit interested in that, please feel free to reach out to me uh, or any of the other officers of the SIG um, um, and let us know that, you, the, uh, let us know that you, you'd be willing. Um, here's the, I, I put in the chat, a link to some more details about what what the positions entail um, and um, how you can get involved. So with that, I will uh, uh, pass it over to Dr. Mary Ola Okay, great. Can everybody see my shared screen? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Just. All right, well, hello everyone. And i um, very, very glad to be part of the seminar series about systematic review and meta-analysis. And so also thanks so much uh, to Terry and to James for organizing this and for the very nice introduction. So the, today I'm going to talk about one specific meta-analytic technique that could be used for the synthesis of single case design research. Um, before I get um, started with the content, I just want to recognize IES, the Institute of Education Sciences, for their continuous support uh, for my research. And um, so the work that I'll be presenting on today is actually the result of three consecutive grants. And especially the last one, so the first two that are listed here are completed, but the last one is still ongoing. And that is all about assessing generalizability, variability of single case design effect sizes using multi-level modeling with the inclusion of moderators. So that is really the topic also of my talk. And I also want to recognize my current research lab here at the University at Albany, uh, Yukang Su, Pampanyan, and Sinyun Su. They've been involved in the simulation study, if I get to it at least, that I'll be talking about today. And then also my close collaborators on IES grants, especially Wim van der Noordgade, also the, my academic um, father, I want to say. 
um, then Natasha Barrett was in John Perrin. And then I'll also be talking about um, an empirical demonstration and my colleagues from Germany um, are involved in that. So um, I see a lot of familiar faces joining us here today, but I also do see a lot of, um, I mean, faces, names, um, names and faces. Um, but I also see a lot of new ones. So before I get started talking about IPD meta-analysis, I also want to talk just a little bit about single case research because it's important to know the characteristics of these type of research designs to understand why IPD meta-analysis could be extremely helpful. Then I'm going to transition to a demonstration results of a very recent, actually just finished it last week, um, of a, a simulation study. And then um, just some ideas for future research. So I'll get started with um, the design itself. So single case designs, they're really experiments. And what you do need to know as a major feature is that we have one unit. It can be a classroom. It can be an individual that is observed repeatedly over time. And that during um, um, an independent variable that is actively systematically manipulated. What do I mean with that? Well, traditionally, we have an intervention that is on and off, and we measure repeatedly during a baseline, an intervention condition baseline, intervention condition in certain ways. And they, at least if they're designed rigorous, they do have the potential to demonstrate a causal effect. And there are so many different variations of the design. I'm not going to dive into this. Um, but they all do involve that systematic repeated measurement over time and replication across um, cases. And that's actually demonstrated in the next example. So this is here, um, we have case one, so unit one up to unit eight, and they're all part of one single case study. So we can actually see eight single case experiments that are all part of one study. And that is something very important to know moving forward because we do have a hierarchical nested structure already within one study. And that is true because repeated measures within one case are more related one to another than repeated measurements from other cases. And in addition, if we're thinking about meta-analysis, once we're going to combine all those single case design studies, then we also know that cases part of one study are more alike compared to cases from other studies. So this is just to highlight that we really need to think about that dependency. Yeah? And so there's a lot of decisions, of course, we will have to make first at the study, study level itself, because we can have, which is here called a multiple baseline design. So we can see a baseline, the red dots are baseline measures, and then the green ones are intervention measures. Um, and that is replicated across eight cases. Another study might have a baseline intervention, baseline intervention that is repeated across all the cases. No matter what, though, we all always have the replication and we do have the repeated measurements and we need to take that into consideration before we can run a meta-analysis. Now I was just curious and um, um, yesterday or so um, I went to the Web of Sciences and I plugged in some synonyms for single case research, single subject, interrupted time series, intrasubject, subjects. And you can see here, they're quite popular. They're actually very popular, not only in my field, education and special education, but also in a variety of different fields. And so that means that there's so much evidence up there. So it would be nice that we can find appropriate techniques to summarize the research evidence. Um, and this is also demonstrated just for the last, um, like from 2001 until 2022, we can see really that exponential increase in the number of publications. So on the y-axis, the number of publications over time. So um, and that means that we also, we have all that evidence there, but we also need to have the appropriate methodology 
to be able to combine the research evidence across studies. And in that way, we might be able to contribute to evidence-based practices, policy, um, and so forth. So we as meta-analysts, we actually have an important role to play, and we can actually help out a lot of other people by summarizing the literature. So that is why we, we're gathered here together to learn more about meta-analysis, to learn about those techniques, to, to use those techniques to help our respective fields. Um, and so using meta-analysis, we really want to summarize the magnitude of intervention effect, investigate intervention heterogeneity, because it could be that across all the studies, you have something that is large, but maybe there's a lot of variability between studies, but also between cases nested within studies. That is a particular interesting thing to look at when we're working in the field of single case research. And if there's a lot of heterogeneity, then it is important to look into moderators, identify moderators and seek ways into how to add those moderators to our models so we can explain heterogeneity. And that brings us actually to the uh, meta-analytic technique that I'm very, um, very curious about um, and that I'm actually also very excited about. And I've been al already looking in this technique since 2010, 2011. So that's, um, and, and, and I learned a lot um, about this technique, ab about its potentials, but also about its, this, um, its challenges. So I'm going to talk a bit about that today. So raw SCD data meta-analysis is sometimes also called the raw individual patient, or you can also say individual participant data meta-analysis. And so why is it called this? Well, um, a interesting feature and which I really like about working in this field is that it is required for single case design studies to be published, to have a graphical display or to include the raw data and tables. So we actually do have for all of our participants, session one, two, three, four, five, with their outcomes and an indicator whether that outcome that was measured is part of the baseline or the intervention which is nice because then we don't really overly rely on things that are um, mentioned in the primary level study. So we don't rely on the researchers reporting a effect size that we can then code and use in our meta-analysis. No, we do have all the raw data. That's why it's called individual patient participant data meta-analysis. We have all the raw data and we can calculate whatever we are interested in. So I'm going to talk about that in a bit. Um, and so why is it called, um, sometimes also called um, IPD uh, multi-level meta-analysis is because we're also taking the different levels into account. So we have the repeated measures nested within participants, the participants within the studies. So that are a couple of things that are important to understand moving forward. So we do have all the raw data, the individual participant data. And we do have a three-level structure um, that we need to take into consideration. Um, so here you can see it actually summarized. Um, so it is what is um, nice about this is we have that overall intervention effect across cases, across studies, but we also have the between case and the between study variability, which in traditional meta-analysis you might not have. And then here we, because we do have the three levels, we can add moderators at the different levels, which is nice. We don't need to work with aggregated study uh, characteristics. We can actually add gender and age um, at the second level. We can add study quality, study setting, and other moderators at the third level. So those are all very, very nice and desirable characteristics. Now, um, if we're thinking about IPD meta-analysis, there's actually two main different approaches that can be distinguished. And that has been um, called by uh, Lise de Klerk, Wim van der Noordhout and the team as one stage IPD meta-analysis versus two stage IPD meta-analysis. Um, and what I'm going to talk about more is that two stage IPD meta-analysis. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that, um, which I'm also going to explain in a bit. But why is it called two-stage? 
Well, we have a stage one, which could also be called a pre-processing step. And so at the first stage, what we're going to do is we're going to estimate um, effect sizes for each participant. So from each unit, from each case, using the raw IPD data. So we have that pre-processing model, and this is an extremely simplified model. It can be anything that is truly reflecting the pattern of the individuals that are part of your meta-analysis. But let's say that we're purely assuming for each of the participants uh, in all the studies, we are seeing quite stable baselines and quite stable intervention phases. And so we're fitting here a model that is just a change and level. So TRT stands for treatment, is a dummy coded variable zero if the measurements are the baseline phase, or one if we're part of the intervention phase. So we know then that beta zero JK is the baseline outcome score for participant J nested within study K. So J always stands for case and K will stand for study. I is measurement location. So we're modeling here measurement outcomes, all measurement location I nested within case J, nested within study K. Yeah. So, and we're fitting this model for each of the participants. We can estimate the baseline level for each individual and estimate the change in level, which would also be called the intervention effect, your effect size of interest. And then um, what we're going to do is we're going to use that estimate of that beta 1 JK, also called B1 JK. We're going to use that as an effect size um, in our three level meta analysis. And that is then the stage two. Yeah, so we have one stage, the pre processing step, and then we have actually our IPD meta analysis. Um, just very, very briefly, I'm not going to go too much into detail about this, but the main rationale why I'm voting this time, I'm not always using two-stage IPD meta-analysis, but this time I am because when we're adding moderators, the model can get pretty complex and we do have a lot of parameters to estimate and we might run into things such as convergence issues and so on. So for a lot of reasons, um, I'm using uh, the two-stage IPD meta-analysis and here you can see the difference in the number of parameters to be estimated. If we use one stage without the pre-processing step, we will actually end up with having two fixed effects. So the overall baseline level across all studies and the overall intervention effect across all studies. And then we will have three components, various components to estimate at level two and level three. Whereas it's only one fixed effect here, the overall average intervention effect and the variability of that intervention effect between cases and between studies to be estimated. So one, two, three um, versus all of those components makes a big difference. Yeah? So that is why we're using that pre-processing step. And um, Lise de Klerk, um, I was also part of this, um, of this simulation study. We actually did find um, that although we do have less information because we're not combining the raw data across cases and across studies, we're using the effect size first and combining that across cases and across studies. So less information that did not lead towards any disadvantages. Um, so the precision, the bias of point estimates were very similar. So, um, so I don't see any issues with using this um, more parsimonious model. So two-stage IPD um, meta-analysis, here you can see that pre-processing step, and then here you can see, I did not yet explain that, but what we're doing after we have our effect size of interest, it could be that you have more effect sizes of interest, that you have a change in level, changes in trend, any other functional forms. That is the beauty, and, and, and it's very nice to work um, with individual raw data. You can fit anything you want in that pre-processing step. And then you combine those effect sizes of interest um, across cases and across studies. So at level one, we really have that observation level. So we have our effect size, so B1JK. So that's the intervention effect for case J nested within study K. That is a function of the true 
participant specific effect size beta. And then here, the residual standard deviation. And that's not any different um, uh, compared to traditional meta analysis. That is something that is known because that has been obtained from the pre processing step. And then it's straightforward to have that here, that beta 1 JK, be allowing that to vary at level two. So beta 1 JK equals a study specific intervention effect. And then how case, cases J nested within study K are deviating from that study specific intervention effect. And those deviations are assumed um, to follow a normal distribution with this variance that will be estimated. And then we can, we, I mean, that we, we could stop here, but then we only have a summary of uh, the intervention effectiveness within a study. If we go further and we combine it across studies, we allow all of these study specific effect sizes to equal an overall effect across all the studies. And then we can here see how studies K deviate from that overall um, intervention effect across all the studies. Again, the deviations are assumed to follow a normal distribution and with a certain variance that we can estimate. So, long story short, um, what we're getting out of running such a two-stage IPD meta-analysis is the estimate of gamma 100, which we're very interested about. What is the magnitude of that? Is that large for our field or not? But then also, what about the variability? Is there a lot of variability in that effect size estimate between our cases? So that would be that sigma square u. And what about between the studies, that sigma square v1? Yeah, so that are the traditional parameter estimates that we really care about and that we're interested in. So you can see it here again summarized. Um, and if you think that is the end, we can transition to the empirical demonstration and looking into the results of a simulation study. It's not um, because there's a couple of things that we still need to do um, and to think about. And the one major thing is standardization, because the empirical example is the example of the study of um, Carolina um, Erten, so the German team. Um, when looking into the primary level studies, you will see that uh, some single case design studies use a percentage, others use a sort of compositive score, might even use a count. So those scales of the dependent variables, they vary also a lot. There's a lot of variability there. Um, so standardization is needed, and luckily we do have a standardization procedure that we can apply. So if you think back about that pre-processing step that we're estimating our B1s, assuming there's only one effect size we're interested in, um, we first need to standardize those effect sizes before we can combine them. And so we would uh, divide them by, so B1, JK, be dividing that by the estimated residual within case standard deviation, which we actually already get also out of that pre-processing step. So that's very convenient. So if you see that B apostrophe, that means that we applied a standardization procedure. So that is great to bring all the studies on the same scale before combining. However, when we looked into this a little bit closer, it actually, especially when you have a small number of repeated measures within one participant, we might not have a good standardization procedure. There's some bias. <laughs> so before we even can then combine, just moving to step two of that two step, uh, that two stage um, IPD meta-analysis, we need to actually corrected for bias. And so um, we all looked into one standardization method, but then um, uh, yeah, Lale Yamshidi and uh, was also part of these studies. We, we compared a couple of different bias correction techniques. And so it appears that Hedges correction, and you probably are all very familiar with that one, also can be applied for single case research designs. And it actually was the best um, bias correction factor. And by applying this, it actually removed all the biases that we that we found. So we were very excited um, about that. 
So we would multiply our standardized effect size with this um, little bias correction. Very simple, like very simple, but it solves a lot of issues. And here our M in the denominator is the number of measurements, so I, the number of measurements within a case, minus the number of parameters. So if we have an intercept and just a change, that never would be two, and then minus one. And then, of course, we cannot forget to also apply that correction factor to our standard errors. Then we're actually in good shape, finally, uh, to synthesize our effect sizes across cases and across studies. So the goal here of using that two-stage IPD meta-analysis is getting to that estimate of gamma 100, just to change the level. Um, but there's a lot of applications, and we did a lot of studies too about looking into more complex models. Um, but during this rather very short seminar, I wanted to keep it simple to just convey the ID and give you the possibilities, what's up there. Um, but of course, um, you can we can continue the conversation and you can always uh, contact me afterwards if you're interested um, in, in more complexities and, and so on. But then also, how does the size of the intervention effect vary between participants, vary between studies? And then that is what I am personally very interested in, too, because I, I don't necessarily care about an overall average weighted effect size telling you, telling people this intervention is working. I more so also care about that heterogeneity, and I'm interested in for who is it working, under which conditions is it working, can we explain, can we dive a little bit deeper into this? Um, because if you <laughs> really think about it, you might recommend something that is working for the average person or for the average, it appears to be working in that uh, the, this, the average study, but maybe that didn't happen in any of the studies. So we really want to look into those participant and um, study level characteristics. So um, we can add, so this is exactly the same level one, level two, level three, observation level, case level, study level. Um, you recognize those um, equations. They just look a little bit more complex because now um, we see at level two and at level three, some moderators added. So level one, remember, this is the bias corrected standardized effect size. And then at level two, we adding P number of uh, case level moderators. And then at level three, we have Q number of study level moderators that we can look at. And that brings us to um, a little demonstration. And it's actually that demonstration that leads towards um, the more methodological work that has been done. Because when you're involved in like applied studies and like content related meta analysis, there's always such interesting research questions that come out of like methodological research questions. Because, okay, well, we added X number of moderators at level two and at level three, and nothing was significant. Is that a power issue? If I add moderators, are we still getting unbiased effects? What about the precision? So all those questions always come up and then there's no straightforward answer. So you got to do a, a methodological um, um, research uh, thing. So, um, but before we get to that, this is um, a study that is in progress. It's looking into the effects of graphic organizer interventions on comp competencies for at-risk students with disabilities. And so we're going to use a three-level uh, meta-analysis. So it's actually that two-stage um, IPD meta-analysis um, that I introduced that is applied in this study. Outcomes, the competencies is very broad. They're looking into reading comprehension, writing, and listening comprehension. And then the intervention is any graphic organizer, can be a digital one, non-digital one. Um, some examples are concept maps, cognitive maps, Venn diagrams, and so on. And using this inclusion criteria that are listed here, so they focused on K-12 classrooms, um, specifically single case research um, designs needed to be used. Um, and then they were also very specific um, in, in the paper about the type of graphic organizers and then the outcomes, how they are, are operationalized and so on. I'm not going to dive into those details, but I just wanted to give you just a little bit context. Um, but based upon those inclusion criteria, there were 40 uh, single case design uh, studies 
identified. And across all those 40 studies, there were 159 participants. Now, the first step always to do is to look into all those graphs that are included in all of the primary level studies and then um, retrieving, digitizing the data so that we have per study, all the cases, I called it before T or T, but that would be zero versus one. Then we have a time, then we have Y, um, our outcome variable. And then we can add a lot of other things that we're interested in. And I know this research team was interested whether the graphical organizer was digital versus not, whether it was like a certain type of disability, of the participants or not. Then we have gender, grade, age, um, integrity, Quality was coded according to the Watford's Clearinghouse standards, but was then dichotomized and either not meeting the standards versus meeting the standards. So there's a lot of things um, that are in here, but this is an excellent example of a raw um, me um, meta, a raw meta analytic data set, I'd say. So a first step, what we did is just looking into the effects. I call them sometimes self-monitoring intervention, but it's really graphic organizers here. Um, looking into um, writing outcomes, but there's um, a lot of other outcomes that could also be of interest. And we can make that model more complex, looking into dependent outcomes and so on and so on. Um, but we simplified it here a little bit. Exactly the same model that I introduced before. And then we can make statements such as there is a statistically significant increase in writing and outcomes after exposure of the intervention. So remember that estimate of gamma one zero zero. And so this is really that um, standard, it's expressed in standardized units. Yeah. So that's something important to note. And then we can also have that additional information that I mentioned that I personally would be very interested in, looking also in sources of heterogeneity, variability. And here we saw that um, between cases, there's some uh, variability, but more so between studies, almost double as much as compared to uh, within the cases. Um, so a next step could be to look at moderators, right? And so some examples of study level moderators that the team was very interested in, that was the quality. And actually all of those are coded as being, um, as being um, categorical. And they only had two categories. Um, and that was something um, that I was also curious about. And, but that's a different um, research paper. Actually, we looked into characteristics of moderators in um, meta-analysis of single case designs. And that actually confirms what we have found because the majority of uh, meta-analysis that have been published and uh, using single case designs, they actually are more so coding nominal variables with two categories, maybe sometimes three categories. And then um, there's only really one moderator age that was really sometimes continuous, but sometimes that age was also then um, dichotomized. So um, that's something interesting to see. I, I feel like different fields probably and different dif different research designs um, maybe characterize the moderators a little bit differently. But in this study, they were all dichotomous. Quality and digital look pretty um, okay-ish, but I would feel like integrity, it's very highly imbalanced. So out of the 40 studies, there are only seven um, who had a zero for treatment integrity. And that may also makes me worry a little bit, what about the influence of imbalanced moderators on um, things that we're estimating? And actually at ARA, um, Last year, we, we talked a little bit about the influence about, of imbalances on intervention effect estimates and moderator effect estimates, and there is really um, a huge impact. So we also need to be careful about that. Um, but that are some of the study level moderators they wanted to uh, us to add to the model. And then the participant level moderators age. Age had four missing um, values. So one study did not report to age. And that is why um, one study will be just omitted from the, um, the meta-analysis with the inclusion of moderators. 
And then the disability incidence, this is also highly imbalanced. So I'm also very worried about this, um, about this moderator. And then the other moderators had too many missing data really to work with because I think we had 159 participants, but if you have missing data for 80 per 75 participants. So unfortunately I did tell the, the team that adding those moderators would result in a loss of so many uh, studies or we would need to look into some imputation methods or other things, which um, that area is also very underdeveloped. Um, but adding this to the model, so age incidence at level two and digital versus um, and quality. So, so digital was using any digital versus not, quality met the water clearinghouse standards versus not, low incidence versus high incidence, disability, and age is just a continuous variable. That was mean standard also to give useful interpretations. These are the results. Um, so we find the D total here is the um, the change in level. So the intervention, so that gamma one zero zero that I was talking about. So that is here two point fifty six. If we didn't have any moderators, that was above above three. If you remember from a couple of slides ago. So we see that um, by adding those moderators, it actually went from statistically significant to not being statistically significant. But I care more about the magnitude and is that really something large? So an increase of 2.56 standardized units in writing outcome performance controlling for the other moderators. So that is really what we're here um, thinking about. And then we can see age, incidence, uh, digital quality, they all have a positive effect. So controlling for incidence, digital and quality for every increase in age, we actually also have an increase of 0 0.21 standardized units in writing outcome. None of these are statistically significant. Um, I told you about the incidence moderator, so highly imbalanced. If you run this model without, we can actually see a couple of things changing. Um, to our model. Anyway, we can add more moderators, we can add um, some other complexities, but at the end, when um, I'm looking at such a study, I'm really always asking myself the question, um, those results, can we trust the results? Are the intervention and moderator effect estimates unbiased? Are they precise? What about the standard errors? Are they unbiased? Because otherwise those statistical inferences about significance um, are also hampered. And then also, is there actually sufficient power to estimate true intervention and moderator effects? So there's those questions and there's a list of, of a lot of more questions that I can add here, but those, when I'm looking every time, when I'm looking into running a meta-analysis, those type of questions come up. And I feel like every time there's a, a new um, simulation study uh, that needs to be done uh, to really investigate in this uh, particular things. Now, I think um, I do still have a little bit of time. So this is then actually the Monte Carlo simulation study that is related to just this um, demonstration study. So my questions that I'm embedding in methodological research always come out um, of um, uh, being involved in running meta-analysis and all of that. Um, and so the purpose here was really looking into, um, yeah, what under which realistic single case design conditions? So what about the number of measurement occasions, participants, the number of studies, the magnitude of the intervention effect and the moderator effects and, and the variability? Um, so under which of these realistic conditions um, can we actually estimate our effects and moderators with appropriate statistical properties? So that is um, the study that we just completed last week. So, um, and we, we tried the best we could to get the results summarized so we can disseminate them um, during this seminar. Um, so what did we start with? Well, based upon that, um, I think I briefly mentioned that paper that we did a systematic review looking into the characteristics of uh, participant and study level moderators in context of single case design meta-analysis. And what we did find is they most commonly include zero to two moderators at level two and three, um, no, zero to two moderators at both levels two and three um, of, um, of the model. And that the scale is most of the times nominal. 
most commonly used uh, combination is two nominal and one continuous variable. So given with this information, um, we um, thought, of, well, I'm not going to talk about these tables, but here you can see all the details of the moderators that um, based upon that systematic review, but I'm just going to skip that. Um, based upon that, we actually generated single case data using a multiple baseline design using um, this combined model. And that model, I already introduced that to you. It just have a set of level two and level three moderators. And we had actually four models of interest. Model zero is our baseline model. We have no moderators. And then we gradually made it a little bit more complex. So what if we have one moderator at level two and level three, two moderators at level two, one at level three, and then two, two, which would be considered um, according to the field as one of the most complex uh, scenarios. We can go on and see if things are still looking really great and good under realistic conditions. What if we would have three moderators at level two and level three and so on and so on. Now there's um, a lot of design conditions that we allow to vary. Um, so the number of studies went from 10 to 50. Measurements within cases 20 or 40. Cases within studies 4, 7, 12 or 20. These are all very realistic conditions that we encountered in the literature. And then we varied the uh, magnitudes of the intervention effects. So that again, that gamma 100, zero, zero. and then also the moderators at level two and level three. And then we, for now, we kept the variance between cases and between studies at a constant value that is also based upon our previous um, findings. Um, long story short, we do have a lot of conditions to investigate. Of course, the more complex the model, the more conditions to investigate, because if we having more moderators at level two and three, and we always allow to vary the magnitude of all those moderator effects, it easily gets into a lot of conditions. And for each condition, we generated thousand data sets. So we have a lot of data sets to analyze. Um, this is all information you already know. We know the pre-processing model, the standardization, the bias correction included, and then we're looking into model 0, 1, 2, and 3, how they're performing. And so we looked into all these statistical properties, so relative bias, mean squared errors, relative standard error bias, coverage proportion, and power. Now, um, there, the results are in there, very, very briefly summarized. Um, and I must say nothing too, too surprisingly are, um, came out. Um, just I'll just sum it up. So for model zero, no moderators, um, we could see that um, the intervention effect estimate, so we have no moderators, we only estimate the intervention effect, wasn't biased in all conditions. Um, even the number of cases had a large effect, um, but we don't really care too much about that because no matter if we only had like even 10 studies with four cases, I equals 20, it was unbiased, which was good news. However, for models one to three, remember we're adding gradually more and more moderators. Um, we did not really identify design factors that has a significant effect and large effect on the relative bias. Um, but what we did find is that if we only have 10 studies with four cases, the relative bias of our intervention and moderator effect estimates, so that relative bias was always larger than 0.05, which would kind of be like the threshold. Um, so our advice here for the point estimates, if we want them to be unbiased, we need to have more than 10 studies. Um, then the mean squared error, nothing too surprisingly there as well, because um, the top number of studies, that's kind of like what we learned out of previous research, they had the large, um, largest effect and statistically significant effect on the mean squared error for both intervention effect and moderator effect estimates. Um, and then we could also find, in addition to that, for the models that included moderators, the number of cases also becomes very important. And then we kind of like graphically displayed that in the next couple of slides. Um, here you can see we kept one, uh, the other um, parameters constant, and that is why 
Why is that? Well, they didn't seem to have a significant impact. So no matter what we would have picked, it will show the same pattern. Um, and we also verify that. So we can see here the patterns. It's nice number of studies, larger mean squared error, lower. But then we could also see for the moderator effects, the number of cases plays also an important role. Because if you only have 10 studies, but you add up to 12 cases, that mean squared error goes down by a lot. And so we can see and tell the same story for models two and for models three, where we have more um, moderators added. Relative standard error bias, that's also a characteristics we really do care about. And again, it's the number of studies that has um, a large impact. And then in general, what we can say is again, for the condition when we have only 10 studies and four cases, no matter for all the other things that we varied, we have 10 and four cases, we can see that the absolute value of the relative uh, standard error bias is larger than 10. So I'm just going to skip the graphs, coverage proportion here. Um, also, we just got those results in from last week. I wanna have another look into this particular uh, property because it seems like we have, I mean, in general for models zero to two, it was fine and it was close to an acceptable range. However, that most complex model, there were some coverage proportions that were, I mean, the smallest one was 14.40%. And then a lot of conditions actually had less than 0.90 for that coverage proportion. So I want to look a little bit um, deeper into that. And then the power, um, no surprise there that also the number of studies um, had an effect, but then also, of course, the magnitude of the gender effect, the magnitude of any of the other um, um, moderator effects that we're looking at. So let's say that we're looking into, do we have enough power to estimate the gender moderator? Well, the magnitude of gender, that effect, um, if that is larger, the power will be higher to detect that. So there's no surprise that the magnitudes of gender, the magnitude of um, the other moderators, right, also have an influence on the power to detect its um, true um, effects. Um, I was pretty surprised and pleased seeing the results because um, power values less than 0.80 were only found when the number of studies is 10 and the number of cases is four and the number of observations is 20. So that also played a role. So um, it is also reflected in the graphs. Um, of course, it's relative to the chosen parameter values and conditions that we looked at. Um, but here you can see the larger, for instance, here, gamma 110 is a true value of gender. And then we can see if we only have 10 studies, yet a power will only be 0.60. However, if we're then having, uh, if, if the magnitude of the gender effect becomes larger and larger, that power increases too. So there's definitely some um, conditions that we do have sufficient power. Um, and then some other graphs, um, show really, really the, the, the difference between the number of studies. So you definitely want to have 50 studies and you definitely want to have the true value for the quality parameter to be high to be able to detect the effect with enough. So there were some interesting things to look at, um, but I'm just um, I just wanted to give you the general um, ID, how important actually the magnitudes of the moderator effects and the number of studies that we're having, how important um, they are. So it's uh, uh, summarized here again. Um, I would be very, very, very cautious about running a two-stage IPD meta-analysis with moderators if we have less than 10 studies. And then of course, it also depends on a set of other um, design conditions and parameter values um, if we wanna have enough power and so on. And then to end, there's uh, many uh, recent developments in the field. I sometimes find it really hard to catch up on all the research um, that is coming out. Um, but we we actually did develop a power SCED tool for two level um, synthesis of single case design data. And we're working on expanding it to three levels now. We're looking into some Bayesian estimation procedures and Bayesian mediation analysis. 
some waiting strategies if we're having very complex scenarios. And I'm also curious, um, I want to dive a little bit deeper into the new Watworks Clearinghouse standards for single case designs and what they actually say um, about meta-analysis in the standards. Um, so that is also something that I'm very interested in. And then um, we do have time for questions. So um, I'm going to pause here and see if I, did I miss anything in the chat box? Um, Um, I think I do see. I can read the questions out loud. Um, Danny Swan had a question. Does your standard, standardization procedure always assume that the errors of the individual observations are independently distributed? Yeah, I did not talk about that. And that is indeed um, going back to that pre-processing step. Um, we did indeed make that assumption. Um, I did not look into scenarios. When, I mean, in that pre-processing step, instead of running an OLS, you can run a GLS, and then you can fit some um, functional forms for the dependency. But I'm, I, I didn't really think about that yet, or deal with that, or see how standardization would work with that complexity. So that's an excellent um, question, Danny. If you if you want to do some research about that, <laughs> kindly invite you. Next question is from David. Do you know how correlated the moderators are? Um, we, um, we did look into that, um, but it really depends. Um, on which uh, set of the moderators I should have pulled up the table. Um, but um, I did not include that one particular table, but we we have those, I included in this presentation two tables looking into the scale and the characteristics of level two and level three uh, moderators. And while we were doing that uh, systematic review, we also looked into the raw data in preparation actually of this uh, simulation study. We, um, we also estimated the, um, the the correlations between the moderators at level two and level three and um, surprisingly they were not too high correlated in a way that we added this in the in the simulation study but that would be um, an excellent addition um, extension follow-up of this preliminary simulation study to add actually different degrees of correlated moderators and see how that is influencing things yeah so yeah, also thank you for that question, David. And also a kind invite if you're interested in that follow-up study. I have another question I could ask if... Mm -hmm. um, Do you have any ideas actually? I can ask the question back to you because I know Danny, you've been doing a lot of research as well in this area. So maybe you thought about this issue. No, I don't have anything, any ideas in particular at this moment, but I did want to ask you like a practical question about your, your meta now, your most recent meta analysis that you that you worked on at the standardization stage. I um, mean, you, know, you talked about how you can have these more complex um, functional forms if you want to, um, you know, for instance, like inter intra individual trend, um, like in a multiple baseline design, how often did you did you find yourself using more complex models as opposed to just like the simple change in levels model. Yeah, actually quite a lot also looking into trends and uh, having also the changes in trends. So changes in level and changes in trends are the most commonly um, um, functional forms, I'd say. And then you have actually a, B, a beta one and a beta two or that we're combining across the case and across studies. Yeah, but uh, further than that, it usually doesn't because if you think about those characteristics of single case designs, there's just so little data points to really look and investigate and have a good understanding and know what is a true functional form here that would apply. And sometimes just a change in level is even better than trying to fit like some type of functional form. Right, absolutely, and, okay. And I maybe just... that else. Uh, yeah. Sorry, and maybe that also goes back to the issue of autocorrelation. How can we really know what the true functional form for the autocorrelation is and whether that's not just an artifact of like a trend or misfitting um, the, the trend in it? Also, how many observations would we need to actually have a good estimate of autocorrelation? So it will be a lot. And, and you know, the, the problem is in still cases, we often don't know the real timing of the 
oh, of the observations, right? Oh, so, that's a big thing. Yeah, right, now yeah. we're always assuming session one, two, three, four with equal time in between. In reality, it's not. But Never. then we also looked into the primary level studies, and most of the times that information is just not given. So we just don't know. It's 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 actually in the textbooks. I think James is the one who told who pointed this out to me that like in some textbooks, they're actually people are directed to um, put time by session as opposed to like the real time in their in their um, study. And so like that's kind of a it's like a standard practice that is maybe not what we what methodologists might prefer. Yeah, I just wish that there was like, I mean, there's there's like a whole list of wishes that we as meta meta analysts have that we wish that we're reporting primary level studies so we can do actually a better job. But uh, and that is definitely at least for me one of them. Like, yeah, now we just list uh, we should label it as session number and not really the real time that the data was collected. Yeah. All right, we should we should all get together and write that paper. It would be really fun. And making our wish list. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But David, David uh, Rinskop had a, did you have another question, David? Yeah, I had a couple of comments and questions. Um, one with regard to the analysis with the moderators, or two with, with regard. Um, you noticed that the intercept changed its value bet between with, without moderators to with, with moderators. And uh, I think that may be due to the fact that you didn't center all your variables. You centered age, but you didn't center the others. So the intercept has a different meaning in the moderator model. So it's not surprising that it's different. So the yeah, part, zero versus the, one, that's how they were all coded. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's so right. that'll make a difference there. Absolutely. And the question I asked about moderators was because I can't tell whether the fact that those several moderators are non-significant is due to them just not being significant, or it's due to them being uh, correlated with each other and having collinearity. So that's why I asked the question about that. So you could maybe you could investigate that or do a mm -hmm. stepwise or something like that to, to disentangle th that effect. Yeah. And then and then the the other thing I wanted to ask you a question about was standardization. I can understand the need for standardization uh, between studies because they're using different outcomes. But what I don't understand is standardization within a study where you're using an individual's error variance estimate, because then you could have a case where all the subjects in a study have the exact same difference between the baseline phase and the treatment phase, let's say five points, but they would have different estimates of the standardized effect if they had different variability. So I'm wondering if you could discuss that some. Mm -hmm. What if, I mean, um, and I mean, you're way more embedded in the field of single case designs and been working for so long. But what, and I've seen those studies that they actually do have um, different outcomes or different scales of the outcomes. So in those scenarios, it could be practical to standardize per participant. Um, but then the alternative would be, is that what you're suggesting to standardize using the within study standard deviation instead of the within case standard deviation. I yeah, mean, I, or, I guess or, if, or, or if you like want to do it for, for cases, individual yeah. people, you, if you want to keep on the scale of the individual person variation, it would be an average over the overall. Yeah, yeah, right, because we really want, we care here about the level one, level two, level three. So we're not aggregating per study before combining it across the studies. Here we're really using the case specific effect sizes before we combining across cases and studies. And so it makes sense to use also the within case standard deviation to get that summary. I, you know, that David, I don't, I don't know that I have a problem with the idea of a, of a five unit effect being different across cases if they have different variability, because that's gonna, you know, the, the inter individual variability is gonna have a relationship to like the, the meaningfulness of that change. Right, like right. you've got if the if the magnitude of your of your variability is a lot larger than that five point change for one case, um, but is much smaller in another case, you know your your sort of the meaningfulness of it is different. So um, yes, that's true. Ex except I think of two different things. One is the accuracy is different when mm -hmm. you have different in Fair within enough. subject individual variability, mm -hmm. but the meaning is is the same. A five point difference is a five point difference if they're all measured on the same scale. 
Right. Um, okay. As as many are. We are just at time. Um, I want to think a little bit further about this, <laughs> David. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the standardization has definitely been like a challenge, and like there's, we actually also looked into a variety of different standardization methods um, to use. But yes, um, we need to be careful about the interpretations um, that we're making as well. So thank you for that. Um, so thank you for a great talk. Yeah, we we are just at time here, so uh, I, um, let us. Um, Thank our speaker one more time. Uh, thank you very much, Mariola, for presenting this work. Um, My pleasure. Uh, a, a couple couple other reminders. Uh, we've, we've recorded the webinar. It should be up on our website in about a week or so uh, if you're interested in you know, reviewing anything or looking further into some of these details. And our next uh, uh, talk in the series will be coming up in three weeks on October 21st with uh, Dr. Carol Lunny. We'll be talking about Advances in Methods for Overviews of Reviews, also known as meta-meta. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, ho I hope to see you all again there. Um, and uh, thanks very much for coming. Bye, Mariola.